Welcome to welcome to finite element methods. Today we'll be discussing linear buckling and nonlinear buckling analysis. And what I want to talk about is a failure mode that's extremely important in structural applications, especially space and even aircraft. What we're looking for here is an instability failure mode that can occur when you have compression stresses acting on a structure. And that compression stress field can cause an instability in the structure. So the structure can no longer hold stiffness and therefore is going to basically uh, deform more um, and more easily due to the instability and the lower stiffness that, that, that occurs from the instability. So as an example, take a straw. And if I were to push the straw uh, in compression, you know for a fact there'll be a point in time where that straw stays just the way it looks like. But when you're applying more and more compression, that straw just buckles apart. And, and what, what, what's happening there? Your, your hands move inwards together while you push a straw much more easier. And then you have an amplitude, a deformation that's quite exaggerated. You can see almost like a crease starting to form and that straw completely buckles. So what we want to do is design structures so those kinds of behaviors can be precluded from the design. And for that, I'm, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to go ahead and play a video so you can kind of learn more about buckling. The test article is a 27 and a half foot diameter, 20 foot tall aluminum lithium orthogrid cylinder, uh, very similar to the types of cylinders that were flying on the space shuttle external tank. The test article is a 27 and a half foot diameter, 20 foot tall aluminum lithium orthogrid cylinder, uh, very similar to the types of cylinders that were flying on the space shuttle external tank. Um, in fact, this test article is derived from some uh, excess uh, hardware from the space shuttle program. So it's configured very much like uh, the, the future SLS uh, core stage tank structures, so it's very relevant to what NASA is designing today. In this test, we're going to be uh, trying to simulate a lot of the same types of loads that, that a launch vehicle would be subjected to during flight. That includes internal pressure associated with the, uh, the fuel tanks, as well as flight loads that, that you would see, and that would include uh, compression type forces and, and bending forces, uh, similar to what would happen if you crushed a, a beverage can under your foot. The black and white uh, polka dot pattern you see on the outside of the test article is used in a system called digital image correlation. And uh, what that system does is we have a, a series of uh, 22 cameras uh, surrounding this test article and it's monitoring during the test minute movements of these dots and from that calculating uh, the displacements of the test article. And it's a really powerful uh, type of uh, technique that allows us to watch displacements of the test article during the test on the entire structure because traditionally we would only get point measurements a single gauge here a single gauge there for something this large um, the digital image correlation system really really gives us a lot of good information the NESC NASA's engineering and safety center is the primary sponsor and funder of this uh, project. They saw very early on uh, the need to update these design guidelines and uh, I came to them with a proposal uh, to, to form this project and uh, so they've been the primary funder. The, the primary stakeholders would be uh, people like SLS um, as well as commercial crew um, and then industry at large. We have a large following of, of um, industry partners that come to workshops and we discuss a lot of the data and uh, discuss their needs as an industry. Um, so this project I think is going to have a large impact uh, in the long term, not just NASA and SLS. 
Well, we had several visual cues of this thing buckling. Uh, we look at data to see that it's buckled. We have our digital image correlation uh, data that's streaming real time for us that indicated even before buckling was occurring that the buckling was uh, anticipated. Um, but we can also view the test article outside of our uh, control room window and we have it positioned in such a way that we can see uh, it buckling at the time. And uh, so it was quite dramatic. We could see it buckle, we heard the bang. The shell buckling test has been conducted at Marshall Space Flight Center because inside of our load test annex, we've got one of the largest tensile test machines in the world. We've got a movable crosshead that weighs three million pounds and can react 30 million pounds of axial compression, making it perfect to do large scale structural tests. It's an indoor facility, which makes it ideal for the video image correlation systems that we use to monitor real time strain distributions during actual load, load events. The Space Launch System consists of five major components, the forge skirt, the liquid oxygen tank, the hydrogen tank, the inner tank, and the engine section. I'm going to be the lead test engineer for the forge skirt and the liquid oxygen tank. One of the biggest examples of how this directly affects the, the Space Launch System is we're, we're learning on real, real hardware that's the same size as, for example, the forge skirt. A matter of fact, the Shell Buckland test article is the same diameter as the forge skirt, and it's a little bit taller. So we've got a real life test article that, that, that we're practicing on, we're learning, and we're helping to provide good data to the NESC. And lift off. So let's, let's watch a video of a camp being buckled here at UCLA. Uh, I think it's a good experience to see what's going on. So let's check it out. Hey, why is it not moving? That was not moving, was it? So what you saw, okay, so, so let's watch the buckling video again of the can. And what you're seeing here is we have a can here at UCLA. I had students go ahead and test it in compression to illustrate the buckling mode you get when you compress it. Hey, why is it not Obviously when a can is- That was not moving. Though. When the can is pressurized, you're likely, so what you saw there was a can being buckled and uh, what happened there is as you're applying compression loads, the cylinder will continue to um, deform elastically. But there's a point in time where the walls, the compression stress on the walls is high enough where you have an instability buckling mode. Basically, you have a loss of structural stiffness. Obviously, if I push on that can of coat that's already buckled, the stiffness of it is lower. So buckling is really a structural failure due to excessive displacements, which is a loss of structural stiffness due to imposed loads. Buckling process, the, block, the block, buckling process basically starts with a structure being subjected to loads. The structure cannot withstand the loads with the original geometry. The structural change shape, the, the structural will change shapes to find a new configuration. And the possible outcomes is the structure displaces considerably. Large deflections may induce plasticity or failure and the structure may or may not fail catastrophically. So those are the outcomes that we need to consider. Here uh, is a, a, a basically a buckling event uh, near where in my hometown in Puerto Rico after Hurricane George 1998. What caused the buckle, what caused a buckle potentially is the wind really pressing against the cylinder, uh, like a lateral pressure type environment. Um, here you see two launch vehicles buckled. Uh, those are common failure modes. Here you can see a business jet hawker uh, with a shear buckle. And you may ask me, how is that possible that we have shear buckling? You can get shear buckling uh, in aircraft by the way that the aircraft is loaded. You have pressure loads, you have tension loads, you have bending loads. 
and then you have even shear loads and the combination of those loads can actually cause shear buckles. Here you see an aircraft uh, carrier, typically buckling tends to be quite critical in this zone uh, here in the center. So we, we're looking at buckling and typically buckling can be looked at um, in terms of stability. So is the buckling stable or not? So take this arch on the right, as I apply a load P, that arch will start deforming and that deformation is going to be quite elastic. Yeah, Professor, you're cutting out a lot, your audio. So here you have, you, here you have a load uh, that's been applied, it's, it's fairly stable, uh, but there's a point in time where things will start kind of deforming quite a bit and the stiffness gets, uh, starts to decrease uh, significantly and that little piece causing a snap through behavior and after the load is applied it can snap to the other side for example what you see here is a load deflection response which is one of the ways that people try to track that behavior you can see the load increases here and uh, in this linear portion uh, you're most likely going to be in this stage where there's small deformations occurring the load piece not causing any buckling but it's linearly deforming, sure. There's a point in time though, you start to get some softening response. And the softening response is a point at which if you were to increase any more load, uh, you're gonna jump into an unstable uh, point here. This straight line here, basically is this bottom, this back, basically this arch bent over like that, the way you see it. So it went from here to here from in one step, from this point to that point. Because if I increase the load just a little bit, it has to jump all the way to the right, which U is the deflection. So obviously it has to jump from here to here. So that's what will happen there. But if I were to control the deflection instead, and I monitored, I applied the deflection and it just held it and slowly applied the deflection. I'm controlling that deflection, right? the load that's necessary to push it to the other side is lower and lower and lower and lower. You can see that happening there. That's an unstable buckling event, but we're really seeing there. But on the load, on the displacement control, you're, you're controlling it. So you can actually make it happen. You can bring it from this configuration to this configuration, slowly to the other side. Well, if I were to apply load control, this arch is going to jump to this shape and well clearly the global response can help you understand that here's an example of a colleague of mine dr gustavo cortez uh, who is an expert in civil engineering uh, civil engineering applications with extensive knowledge of how structures buckle his experience is worldwide used and uh, is with great privilege i want to introduce his work in his work, he has this panel with slits. And these slits that you see here are designed in such a way to cause a potential failure mechanism. Uh, these kind of slits are used in civil engineering applications. What we're seeing here is that if the panel was perfect, then the load most likely will go all the way up with no deflection out of plane. So the deflection out of plane will be zero and you can compress this panel perfectly forever. However, structures are imperfect. And the, since the structure in, is imperfect, the deflection will, the out of plane deflection will increase. You will have a softening response as you see here. And then you're gonna have an unstable buckling event. Because why? Because with increased load, it's gonna jump to nowhere. With deflection control, of course, you can try to follow that dash curve. And, in real life, you, the imperfections can cause more and more um, instability and lower buckling load, for example. I invite you to look at that uh, paper or, or look it up that work. But so let, let's look at linear buckling from the mechanics of materials perspective. And I won't use the time today to derive the equation you see on the screen. Why is that? Because this equation is already shown in mechanics of materials but also this equation is derived in a higher uh, level course. And you can actually go to my YouTube or video energy methods 
And you'll see I have a lecture on energy methods that have to do with buckling. And I derived this equation. But for this course, I think it's sufficient to kind of derive or show you the equation and kind of walk you through the process of what's going on. What you see here is the beam equation. The beam equation is governed by the modulus, the moment of inertia I, W is the outer plane deflection, P is a load applied in compression. What you see here is that this term right here is really comes out of really geometric nonlinearity. This term comes out of considering higher order terms in strain deflection relationship. What are the boundary conditions that we see here? So that, that's very interesting. The boundary condition here on the left-hand side is clamped, so the deflection is zero, but so is the slope. On the right-hand side, what you see is a deflection zero, but that there's no other moments applied, so the moment or W double prime is zero. And uh, the general solution to this governing differential equation is just this one. You can find that in Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha or MATLAB, but this equation you will get. And no, notice how mu depends on a load P, and then you, and this is also divided by EI. So clearly something's going on here that's gonna get really interesting, but the boundary conditions play a role in how you find A0, A1, A2, and A3. That's very important. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and use these boundary conditions to solve for these coefficients. What you will find when you do that is that you get an eigenvalue problem because, you know, plug in zero in here, right? And when you do that, you're going to see that every equation will be equal to zero on the right-hand side. The trivial solution, you, you'll see very quickly how, how A sub naught should be zero and A1 is zero. Uh, by enforcing the first two boundary conditions. Uh, the rest of it, A2 and A3, can be found through this eigenvalue problem. You can see that what I have here is this equation here, which is really taking two of the equations. You have four equations because you have four boundary conditions. And two of the equations turn out to be this because we already know that A0 and A1 is zero. So that simplifies it. And you get the trivial solution. The trivial solution is A2 and A3 is zero. So does that make sense? So if A0 is zero, A1 is zero, A2 is zero, A3 is zero, then the out of plane deflection is also zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. If I apply a load in compression, there's a good reasonable possibility that this beam stays straight as much as it can. But there's a point in time where mathematics and physics come together in a miraculous way. Why? Because an eigenvalue problem can help me determine so what I do, I, I take this determinant here and set it to zero. And I know that there's two solutions to the problem, either A2 is zero, A3 is zero, or the determinant of this matrix is zero. That's one another possibility. So you can then get this non-trivial characteristic equation whose solution gives you a critical load. So this, this will give you a value of mu and L, which you can solve for. And the lowest value will be P critical equals 20.16 EI L over square, div EI divided by L squared. Why is this a mathematical miracle? Let's think about that. This was an eigenvalue problem. And an eigenvalue problem is a mathematical condition that we need to satisfy. But what is incredible is if I went to the lab and did this experiment, and, and I took a beam and loaded it up in compression, I will be able to predict buckling fairly accurately. Meaning this buckling phenomena is something that you could measure if you wanted to, but you could also solve it mathematically. And mathematically, and, phys and maths and physics are coming together to tell us, hey, listen, this beam will buckle at 20.16 EI divided by L squared. Maybe not perfect, because not every beam is perfect. Not every, every single beam has the same thickness. But in the ideal world, where you have a particular beam thickness, particular, particular length, the modulus is perfectly whatever it is supposed to be for the aluminum or steel or titanium or inconel or whatever you're using, that's a mathematical miracle. Because I did that test, and that test by itself is attempting to solve a mathematical problem that happens to be an eigenvalue problem. The other thing I want to point out is that 
This is similar to the eigen frequency conversations we had earlier when we're discussing modal dynamics. But this is this is reasonably uh, this is reasonably miraculous what we've shown here. Okay. Yeah. So so the 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 amplitude is unknown because the determinant is what's zero. So a twenty three could be whatever. But the determinant has to be zero. That's what matters. So you can calculate the buckling. The mode shape, the shape that the beam will take is known. But we don't know what the amplitude of that beam is going to be. And that's because the determinant is, is zero. And so A23 could be whatever, right? So that's why that's happening. If there is a possibility. There is a possibility where buckling load could occur at a higher load than the yield point of the material. Meaning you could buckle it, you can actually call plastic buckling, meaning you're plastically deforming the material as you buckle it. So that can absolutely happen in a structure. So, so what, what we got here is, is a, something very interesting that we can actually solve using finite elements. So given this governing equation, what can I do? I could use a weak form galerkin. So that's the that's the governing question. That's a strong form of the problem. Okay. I can multiply this by V and then integrate it by parts to remove the derivatives, two of them, and put it on V because I want to divide the derivatives in half. When I do that, I get uh, this. This is the weak form after you integrate by parts. And I won't do the, the steps because you you are an expert on how to do this. So I invite you to go ahead, pause the video and try to get this done. And if you're able to show the equation on the bottom. So with that said, I'm ready now. So I'll select, you know, in this case, I got the weak form of the problem. I can use whatever boundary conditions I want. I'll use a pin pin since earlier I did a clamped beam, a clamped pin. So we'll select a pin pin beam. And we will note that there is no shear moments applied when you have a pin pin condition. You just have a beam that has a pin on one end, a pin on the other end, and you apply compression loads. And the idea is to find when it buckles. So here, what you see is that all the boundary conditions will dis disappear, period. Because if it's pin pin, that means that the deflections are zero and the, there's no moment or shear applied at either end. So therefore, all the boundary conditions vanish, and all you get is the equation here at the bottom. That's the equation you get. That will be true for most buckling problems. I can then use order Bernoulli beam theory to approximate the solution. So I'll use the Hermitian cubic functions, which we already discussed. And I'll use these cubic functions as the basis functions in the weak form Galerkin. And the idea is that I have a number of degrees of freedom on the node i. In node i, I have the deflection and the slope. In node j, or the second node, I have the deflection and the slope at that node. But regardless, I can take these approximation functions, plug them in here, and I can approximate the beam deflection using these shape functions. I'll put this in, in, in bold. I'll put this column vector in d bold. And recall, we derived these equations in a previous lecture about three or four lectures ago. But again, we're trying to approximate the solution over beam and then apply that to every single other aspects of the design. And here is, I'm sorry, the diagram did not show up earlier, but you can see here the rotation V1, the rotation V2 and so forth. So I'm ready now to use the weak from Galerkin. I'm ready to plug in W of X equals NX D bold. I can also take V and put it as M bold transpose, plug it in. And when I do that, this is the equation I get. And what I notice is for the first time ever in this course, we've seen that the bold factors out, uh, out of the whole thing and the right-hand side is zero. And that's very interesting because we haven't seen that situation before, uh, but this is an again value problem on P, which we can solve using the characteristic equation. So we can see here very clearly how we have an eigenvalue problem on P. Why is that? Because I have a D bolt here. 
one solution is that the ball is completely zero, which means that the beam is totally straight, or the determinant of the matrix that results from this operation is zero, that, that determinant. So let, let's look at how that those integrals play out. So I know how to integrate that. That's easy. And I'm able to integrate uh, the load as well, right? So we know how to integrate this right here. That should be easy. Um, once I do that, and, and that's what that integral is, by the way, the integral, this right here is this right here. So we can then uh, notice here that there's a pin pin problem which means that v1 is zero and v2 is zero because it's pinned on either side. I'm only looking at a single element. That's why it's so much easier, right? A much easier problem to deal with. And so I, I can now uh, eliminate these two equations here and just focus on, the, on this second and, and fourth equation. And when I apply the determinant, I can find that the for the one element, p critical is 9.69 ei over L squared, we also have that the second, because if you have N degrees of freedom, you will have N buckling modes. In reality, when you have an a infinite, not a finite system, but an infinite system, meaning I'm not really dividing the subdomain, I just have a, a continuous domain. A continuous domain is gonna have N infinite number of buckling loads infinite number of them. The one that really matters are the lower value ones. You can see for the one element solution, one beam, I get 9.69. The exact solution is 9.86, which we can find in the mechanics and materials handbook. So very close solution. The second eigenvalue is way off, but that makes sense. I'm using one element. I'm not using two elements. So, Typical design practice, you design to the lowest buckling value, the, the lowest value. So in design practice, obviously this is a good job. If you wanna be thorough and find all the different buckling modes, uh, then these are the ones. Now, why it could matter? I'll show you very soon. Shell elements on the buckling are gonna have multiple buckling loads uh, that are closely spaced. So it's worthwhile looking at multiple buckling modes because they're so spaced to each other that it could hit any of those buckling loads. I'll show you a picture later on to kind of illustrate that point. Another point I want to make of great importance here is that for beams, if I were to do an experiment in a lab, this solution will not be too far off from what I'm finding with fine elements. So if I plug in the modulus, I, L, L, at the critical load I should get, the buckling load will be fairly in good agreement with the experiment if you're considering an almost imperfect ruler, whatever you're trying to, like whatever beam structure you're trying to compress, this should be fairly close in solution wise. So, but if I shift my attention now to cylinders, and not yet, let me show you how to do this in Abacus quickly first. In Abacus, what I want to do, I define, I do, I'm doing it for single element. So basically following the same process I have here, single element, define the element connectivity, up, define the cross section, define the materials of the of this beam, and then here you put NLG ohm equals yes to tell abacus to to ensure we're looking at large deflections, and then you have start buckle, and the buckle command will extract two eigenvalues. You can put more if you want, um, but that's what I did here, and then I have the boundary conditions, which is pin pin or pin roller because I want to be able, I want to, I want to be able to have a situation where that right rotor can, can move. You also have the, the, the load applied uh, in this case is a load applied in the one direction with a magnitude of minus one. That means I'm applying a load compressing this beam. That's what I'm doing really. So that's a load in the one direction compressing the beam because it's pointed to the left. And that's exactly what I'm doing and that's why I have to pay attention how I'm setting up the boundary conditions and everything else. And this is gonna spit out an eigenvalue. That eigenvalue is a load at which buckling occurs. That's really what matters here. That, that's really what we wanna learn, right? So uh, moving forward, you we will be doing a, a project with buckling. So it's important that you understand the concepts 
that I've just discussed right now. Okay, so we're gonna then now for real we're gonna move to cylinders, uh, but before that, let, let's look at cylinders. Um, cylinders are quite interesting because show buckling is actually much more difficult to predict accurately. Uh, the reason is because they're more in, they're more sensitive to imperfections. If, if say for example I have a can of Coke, and I have a little crease on the side due to some dent or somebody bumped it. If I were to buckle that can compared to one that does not have the crease or dent, it's going to buckle. The one that, that has a dent is going to buckle at a lower value than the one without the dent or crease. And the reason for that, and I'll explain a little bit later why is that, but cylinder shell buckles usually are linear elastic, unstable, and they're initiated by geometric imperfections. You could have thickness variations, out of round conditions, lateral loads. You could have situations where it takes that lat that that shell wall and it, the shell wall becomes unstable, and that's the area that does require a lot of work to understand and how to manage that. But that's going to drive buckling. Okay. While if I took the example of the ruler, if I were to have a small little dent in the ruler and I were to apply compression load that ruler is going to bend for example here in this case this pin pin case is going to be a much more behaved it's going to be much more behaved so it's going to look like this i'm going to try to draw it it's going to buckle like that but if i had a little kink there then you're still going to have that buckle with that kink so that kink will basically follow that global deformation that's why these rulers are not, maybe the ruler, the beam is not as sensitive to imperfections, but in a shell, it does matter because the buckling shapes that it takes, you can see that here, have similar shapes as if you were to have a dent. So any dent is going to make the buckling load prediction a lot worse as if you didn't have the dent. That's going to matter. So the linear buckling solution, if you were to analyze in finite elements, this solution right here is going to match this solution right here. And it's going to match and it's going to be exciting to see that. The, this is a solution you get for from a hand calc. E is the modulus, nu is the Poisson ratio, T is the thickness, R is the radius. This will give you the line load, which you can compare with the line load that predicts buckling for the finite element model. And there will be in very good, good agreement. The problem is that these two solutions will not match experimental data. Why is that? Because theoretically, buckling strength of shells are really hard to achieve. And the reason they're really hard to achieve is because the buckles, the buckling mode shapes are those dents. Look, they're going to look like dents. But those dents are going to be similar in shape to something you may have introduced earlier in the design process, which is fairly common to have that situation. So you should not be surprised if the buckling load is significantly lower than what you will measure in experiments. What you see here, if I were to take the analytical solution and I had the experimental solution and I took those two, not solution, the experimental test data that was measured if I took that value and divide it by an analytical solution, you can see it approaches one. It approaches one when the radius to thickness is close to zero, meaning it's acting like if it was a solid tube almost. And so that makes sense because if it was a solid tube, it should buckle more as a global phenomenon. So yeah, it matches pretty well. But as the radius becomes really large compared to, compared to the thickness, such as the cylinder you saw, earlier in an earlier video um, you will see that as this increases the experimental prediction will be off by an analytical solution by quite a bit it starts dropping quite a bit uh, to the point that you could even have a it could be off so that the analytical solution is 80 percent off right which is quite significant if you think about it uh, so in design practice what we do we try to correct for this using this curve that was developed and is available in the NASA SP-8007. Now, NASA SP-8007, which is a, a guideline document, it basically teaches you 
how to assess structures for buckling. If you were to look at NASA ASP 8007A, that version is quite powerful because it provides a method to reduce um, the, there's some conservatism here, right? right? The reason you have all these, uh, these variations in test data is because at the time in the 1960s, the manufacturing processes were not well established, but now it's much more consistent. So you may have a way of getting there, right? You may have a way of getting there. So, 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 so we have to correct for that error. And you may say, well, the analytical solution was useless. Well, maybe not. The reason there is an error is because it's very difficult to really characterize these imperfections. And there are ways now that we can do that. And you'll be doing that in a project uh, and you'll be learning how to do that today a little bit. Here's where the data came from. It's basically the same data you see here. I've plotted it here in a different way. So I'll just move on and just keep going. Um, here you see examples of buckling. Uh, really uh, looks like a cool pattern. The reason is because they internally put another mandrel or some sort of cylinder inside. So the buckle could occur but in a more controlled manner. That's why you see that. Here you can see another example of a buckled, actually compressed structure. And you can see here that buckles are effectively large and the behavior greatly reduces the imperfection sensitivity because the stiffening elements are causing these more global type buckles. So smaller imperfections are not as big of a deal compared to, you know, similar to rulers. The rulers example we discussed is a local density, is a local uh, issues with a structure that causes this large scale knockdown factors. We call it knockdown factors from test to analytical solutions. Here is an example of when you apply torsion, you can also have a situation where you have a knockdown factor, but I'll move on. I want to kind of cover this slide here. Point here is, and by the way, now it's 8007A, that's a new version available. NASA SP 8000A provides a buckling of thin wall cylinder, uh, circular cylinders. So you can actually do an analysis by hand and do the calculations. NASA SP 8019 provides it for thin walled truncated cones. NASA ASP 8032 provides that for buckling of thin wall doubly shells. NASA ASP 8068 provides buckling strength of structural plates. So th those are the, the, the guidelines you can download to do the hand calculations if required. 8007A goes a step further and teaches you how to derive basically this curve that you see right here but using analysis. And you'll be doing that because you're going to be using the state of the art, the latest in technology when it comes to analysis, right? We don't want to keep using old stuff if there's better ways to do analysis. So I'll show you how to do the analysis, right? So the first, there's two approaches to how to, how to really deal with this. So approach number one. Approach number one is that you apply you, what are you gonna do? You're gonna apply a limit load, the maximum load that you expect to experience in service. That structure will experience a million pounds. That's what you put in the model. Meaning here, let me go back so you can see what I'm saying. In this input file, I put a million pounds. In, on the star C, I'll put a million pounds. That's what I wanna put there, right? And what, what the code is gonna produce is an eigenvalue. That value is going to be a multiplier to the this uh, is, is going this knockdown this eigen value is basically how much more capability you have for buckling, and so I apply a million pounds, which is the limit load. This lambda becomes your eigen value. You multiply that by the knockdown factor. The knockdown factor is your correction factor that got derived basically using this curve you see here, that curve right there. That corrects it for experimental data. So the knockdown factor, say your R over T is 100, you go here, straight line. Okay, that's about 0.6. Then you come here, you put 0.6 times a million pounds, not a million pounds, 0.6 times the eigenvalue, divided by the factor safety minus one, and you get the margin of safety. And you may ask me, well, where is the load? Where is the million pounds go? The million pounds goes into the model. 
the analysis will produce an eigenvalue, which tells you what additional capacity you have for the structure to survive the buckling event. So if you apply a million pounds and your eigenvalue is one, that means that you're right at buckling, right? So that, that's what it means. But not only that, it's worse because you have to multiply this by a knockdown factor. And so you have to find a way of making this positive, really. You want the margin safety to be positive. Factor safety is provided. Usually one and a quarter for uh, spacecraft applications, 1.4 for human space flight applications, 1.5 for aircraft applications. But this number is going to vary depending upon the program and the application. Lambda is the value that comes out of the code because that tells you how much more capability you have to sustain the loading environments. Times the knockdown factor, which comes from this curve. So let's look at a cylinder on their actual loading. That was done in Abacus. And you can see here, I apply compression load and then I'll use the buckling load eigenvalue extraction procedure. We have several videos online that show how to do that. So how you do that? You, you have the node definition where you know how to do that. You have the element definition with the shell elements. Here I'm using the S4R, I prefer fully integrated. Then you have the star shell section definition tells you information about how thick the walls are. Then you have basically uh, the material called out is aluminum. Then you have to specify the modulus and Poisson ratio, which I'm not showing here. And then you tell Abacus, hey, do a star buckling analysis. Give me three buckling modes. Give me, you know, so you're giving, you're giving specifying information so that Abacus, the software code, can generate the information. Here you can see that only one pound was applied. So what that's going to tell you is, it's going to give an eigenvalue. That eigenvalue is going to be representative of the absolute load that corresponds to buckling, right? Um, in this example, if I had applied, applied one pound, lambda will have been the total load that causes buckling. Um, and so here at the bottom, you'll have to put the million pounds. So a few ways to do it, uh, but the important thing is that you be consistent. Approach 1A, apply the million pounds in the code. So here, I'll apply a million pounds, not one pound. If I apply a million pounds in the code, if I apply a million pounds in the code, Abacus is going to return an eigenvalue, and that eigenvalue times the million pounds represents the buckling load. So in that scenario, lambda is just the XX capacity above the million pounds. And so you don't have to write a million pounds here because uh, lambda already has that in its memory, that that's what it is. But you want the margin to be positive. The second approach is to apply one pound. If you do that, then what's going to happen is your margin of safety now is going to be a lambda, but that lambda is going to be the total load for buckling, not an excess value above a million pounds. It's going to be the total load. And so you have then the knockdown factor. And if you do that here in the denominator, you have to apply, you have to put the limit load here then, if you're going to do it that way, minus one, right? So two ways to do it, approach number 1A, 1A, 1B. Approach one, you're applying the million pounds in the code. Lambda is the excess eigenvalue capacity, the load capacity, which is an eigenvalue. Multiply by the knockdown factor, divided by factor safety minus one, that gives you margin safety. Approach number 1B here is you apply one pound to the structure that produces a eigenvalue. That eigenvalue is a load at which buckling will occur in excess of one pound. But obviously when you're flying a vehicle, it's not one pound, the limit load. That maximum load is gonna be some other value. You have to specify that here. You have that value, you have this value. You have the factor of safety provided by the program. You can calculate the margin of safety. So fairly simple ideas that, that really need to be studied and memorized and understood really well. So Abacus will produce some values here. Uh, bottom line, so say we assume the limit load is 425,000 loads, units of loads, I'm not putting units here. Uh, so not pounds, nothing like that. But 425 units load, the eigenvalue is determined to be 1.147 million units of load. 
that means I have a very robust factory safety. Looks like it, maybe, we'll see. So for this particular example, if I were to look at that, the R over T was close to 100, which means that the knockdown factor is 0.55. So if, if I plug it in here, 0.54, I have the lambda that came out of the model. In this case, one pound was applied to the model. In this case, one pound was applied to the model. The eigenvalue then became the total load, which buckling occurs at. So that's the number you plug in here. The limit though is 425, goes to the denominator. The factor safety, safety is one and a half. Minus one gives you a negative 0.03%. So the design needs to be still more robust than what you see here. The other option was to apply 425,000 pounds in the model. So you apply 425,000 pounds right here, and that will have produced an eigen value of roughly two and a half or so. So that will be, it will still give you the same margin of safety, just two different ways of doing it. So several ways of getting there. Um, and you can see here, I got a negative margin of safety. Now that approach is, a, we call this approach a linear buckling analysis. Uh, it's purely linear buckling analysis. It uh, doesn't mean that we're not considering geometric nonlinearity. We are, but we are only looking at eigenvalue problem. There's a way, there's a way to increase, to be less conservative. There's a way to be less conservative where th this curve was generated, assuming that you have the manufacturing that was available at the time. So this is not even looking at what kinds of imperfections were considered. This is just saying I had a bunch of test data, a bunch of scatter everywhere, and this curve protects me against failure. But a, bit, a more advanced way that's getting a lot of traction in the industry, and it's very, very powerful, is a nonlinear buckling analysis. In a nonlinear buckling analysis, what you're going to do is you're going to rerun, you're going to rerun this linear buckling analysis here, this one right here. You're going to run that, and then you're going to use the linear buckling solution as the initial imperfection. So basically this, this, this structure, let me show you here, these buckles, you're gonna use them as the initial imperfections. You're gonna say, okay, the structure has these imperfections, these mode shapes. So you're gonna tell the software, hey, let's try to buckle this and let's use those mode shapes as the initial buckles or initial dents. So you, you tell it, okay, if I want to have mode shape one, two, and three. For mode shape one, put an amplitude of 0.2. For mode shape two, put an amplitude of 0.1, an amplitude of 0 0.05 for mode shape three. So you want to look at different types of mode shapes, mode shape one alone, mode shape two alone, mode shape three alone, then a combination of mode shapes. You want to see what kinds of dents you could generate and kind of analyze that. Then what you're going to do next is to run a star uh, basically a nonlinear buckling analysis. How, the way you do that is simply running a star step analysis, static analysis, and you're going to put an NLG on equals yes, because now we're going to do a nonlinear geometric modeling approach, a fully nonlinear geometric modeling, not a buckling, not an eigenvalue problem, but a static solution that's going to start to buckle it, but where the amplitudes become more and more meaningful. The Ricks method is a more advanced concept, but what it does, I'll just show you in concept what it does. You can see that it may be very difficult to trace the structural response for a structure like this, uh, because the load goes up and then it decreases. And that's very hard to do in a software, to apply load until it buckles and then tell the software, hey, reduce the load, figure out a way of reducing that load while the deflation increases. That's very hard to do. The Arkland, the arc length method, which is a very advanced method, what it does, it allows to trace the structural response successfully. You're able to do that. And that's very powerful because now you can actually trace the response. Here, what you can see, I applied a million pounds in this particular model. And what I wanna do, I wanna trace that response now. And what's gonna happen is, you're gonna use the imperfection from the buckling model to drive the nonlinear solution. And what you see here is, as you apply the load, a particular node in the structure starts to get a little bit hot in spot. You can see that that spot is getting hotter and hotter. 
So we can then trace the deflection there because I think things will go haywire there. That's why you're doing that. And the next step is to plot the load. You want to plot the load as a function. Actually, here is a load in the y-axis. In the x-axis, you see, and by the way, this LPF is a load proportionality factor. This LPF is a percentage of the million pounds that I applied right here. So here, in this case, you're going to uh, tra uh, track LPF, load proportionality factor, and you're going to apply the deflection. You're going to trace this dis displacement. That plot, this, this XY plot, is going to produce something like this. You can see it went haywire here. So you know the deflection went out of control about here. So I better start looking at maybe calling buckling somewhere here, right? And that's what we did here. We called it buckling at 0.42 as an example. That's where things went unstable. So the nonlinear buckling analysis is not an eigenvalue problem. We're using the eigenvalue problem in approach number two to more accurately predict the buckling event given the imperfections of the model. Here in the, this case, unfortunately, um, yeah, so in, in, in this particular case, you will see that the, the solution uh, is going to be 0.42, this 0.42 times a million pounds, and that's what you get here. I don't have to apply a knockdown factor because I already considered the imperfection in my model. What you see is something very curious. The margin actually is even worse. It's negative 34%, which is not normally the case. Um, so continuing on, um, here the margin is way worse. But the, 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 the thing I wanted to point out is that usually the lean, this is going to be less conservative. In this case, it was the opposite. My point is you always want to check it as well. Once you use the design, this design guideline, usually this is more conservative. Here, the reason this became worse than the previous solution, which is not normally the case, is because of the amplitude such selected were a little bit more in, in a situation that will never happen. But I did that on purpose to illustrate you could have a buckling event that's worse than the hand calculations, and you have to watch out for that. Note that not always the solution from the handbook SP8007 is conservative, but it's 99% of the time it should be. So there's two ways to calculate in buckling if you're given a structure. The first approach is to perform a linear buckling analysis to determine the eigenvalue A. So you get the value. You then use the knockdown factor from the handbook. And what you're really looking for is this curve here. And you have the R over T. You select the correct knockdown factor. And that's the KF you're going to use your margin calculation. Once you have the eigenvalue in KF, you come down here with the arrow, apply A, K, F, divided by L, L, the limit load. Here we're assuming that we applied a load of one pound, obviously. So the eigenvalue is the total buckling load. And so here you can see how I calculate the margin. That approach usually is conservative. Approach number two goes down here. You scale the eigenvalue to bound the measurements. You take the hardware measurements from a laser scan perspective or, or a profit profilometer, using either of those scanning devices, you can determine what kinds of imperfections you're getting. You take the eigenvector from the eigenvalue analysis, you apply the amplitude from the hardware measurements, and then you perform a nonlinear analysis with those scaled eigenvector being applied. Really, what you're really doing is really modifying the geometry so that it incorporates a dent or something, some sort of imperfection, which is possibly something that could happen in the factory due to tooling impact events. So that could happen. It's not something that may not happen. It is going to happen. So this is going to identify for you the nonlinear buckling load. And the way you're going to do that is apply the load, trace the load proportional factor as a function of deflection of something getting hot around the structure. Obviously, we're trying to track that one. And then as I look here, you can see that deflection went bananas. It just went off, off the charts. So as a consequence, I know is buckling here. It's going out of control. The stiffness has been lost. Buckling most likely is this number. Identify that. Try to determine what LPF is this happening at. 
once given that, you can calculate the knockdown factor, the real knockdown factor. So you know the eigenvalue value, the buckling value from eigenvalue, that's A. You can calculate the nonlinear buckling load, A star. So you basically calculated the knock knockdown factor, not experimentally, but numerically on your own. And what you're going to do is use that value in here, and you're done. Just multiply everything out, and you get the margin of safety. So that's how you will do a buckling analysis in, in any software, actually. Uh, but you will be learning how to do that as, after you follow a tutorial. So I hope that idea of buckling is clear. That buckling event is a mathematical miracle. Because somehow mathematical no, mathematics knows that physically there is this point in time which this load can no this load is applied to the point that this structure can no longer carry more load because the stiffness has been lost. That's what we're calling buckling. We're not calling buckling a structural strength failure where the material breaks apart. We're not talking about plasticity where you have yielding. Now, you could have buckling with plasticity, sure. But what we're talking about here is a very interesting failure mode where the buckling event could be either elastic or it could go uh, deform so significantly that it will never return back to the original shape. But you, I went through two different methods, the eigenvalue method using the handbook, or you derive your own knockdown factor using realistic data that's available to you and making sure that your hardware stays within those measurements. That's what you want to do in real life. With that said, I want to thank you. You have a great day. We're going to hit the very last lecture in the very next video. But for now, we're, we're, we're really making progress in learning the concepts. And so you will enjoy the tutorial as we're going to have a, one of the projects will be using that approach. You have a great rest of your day. Um, one of the questions that you may see later as you study buckling is that as you refine the mesh density, the buckling value become more and more realistic. Using a coarse mesh to do calculate buckling value may not be very accurate. So really what you want to do is to do a mesh density study. You increase the mesh density until you feel very comfortable that the buckling value you got is of high caliber. I'm sorry for uh, saying thank you very much again, but uh, thank you and have a great day.